Hello again, everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of We Are Here to Help. I am Matt Nagy, a business optimization specialist with Schooly Mitchell, helping organizations save time, money, and hassle by dealing with their vendors for them. Uh, in this week's episode, I'm lucky to have a good friend of mine, John Ferguson, on. John, welcome. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Uh, John is an estate planning attorney, and his company is called John Ferguson PLC. Uh, first question I'd, I think viewers want to know is, what exactly is an estate planning attorney, and, and what do you do? Thanks. The, you know, that is a good question, and it's it's not an easy uh, question for people to absorb, as you might think. Um, I think a lot of people have a sense of what estate planning is, and certainly anybody that's lost a loved one has watched uh, the probate process would know immediately that there's value in estate planning, whether they th the person who they've lost had a good estate plan or had no plan um, the person watching this unfold has a sense that a, a plan is, would have been preferable um, or that a plan was worth its weight at that moment. A plan, um, from my perspective, is a system of documents that's designed to take the things that you had in life and give them to somebody who's still living. Let me put it this way. I can buy your car, Matt. We could meet in the parking lot. You bring your car and your title. I bring my checkbook. You know, we sign our names to things and we do the deal. We can do that because you and I are both alive. But if you pass away, I can't buy it from you. So we need somebody to fill that role. And an estate plan identifies who that person would be, how they would go about giving up assets like your car. Um, the car isn't a great example because the honest truth of it is that most states uh, have a mechanism where your surviving spouse can just go down to the DMV with your death certificate and take care of it. But it's a clean example. People understand the concept, if I put it that way. Yep. So a plan is, um, I, I call it a system of documents, and I'll explain more on that in a minute or two. Uh, it's a way for us to um, guide ourselves. It's a roadmap to make sure that our assets are being transferred properly sheltered from taxes, handed to the right person. Um, having a plan allows you to have some peace of mind and, and sense of security um, and certainty as you go through the probate process or potentially avoid the probate process uh, because without one, the state will simply impose a formula on you. That may not be what you wanted. That makes sense. And, and you know, being more of a novice person, but knowing you know a, the words will and trust what is a will? What is a trust? How are they different? You know, how should people be looking at those? Right. Um, the will is still the backbone of a good estate plan. And that's the foundational document from my perspective. There are certainly attorneys that draft estate plans that are trust centric. And for that plan, a trust is the backbone of their plan. The reason I like the will is because the will is the document that goes through probate. The trust does not. So if you have assets that are held outside of trust, and most people do, to be honest with you, having a will tells the world how you want your stuff divided in the probate process. And so a will is a straightforward document, although it's not always a simple document. Um, let me drop a footnote here. Any number of people call me up and they want a simple will. I don't know what that means. There's no such thing as a simple will. So I will impose this definition on it for today's conversation, and this is what I tell my clients. When you ask for a simple will, I'm thinking about a will that takes into account no advanced tax strategy work at all. That, in other words, it will simply take you from point A to point B through probate, and it's done. There are wills that will incorporate trusts or identify the need for a trust inside the will itself so that we can take advantage of um, um, all certain nuances in the tax code or provide for minor children. More on that in a minute. The idea of the will is to simply nominate what's called a personal representative. We used to use the word executor and have that uh, personal representative equipped to go through the probate process. Here's what you do. Here's how you do it. Okay. That's what a will is. A trust runs along a parallel track. A trust is a way to hold a class of assets for a class of beneficiaries. All trusts have that much in common. Um, I use this analogy a lot, so, so I'm going to use it here. An estate plan is like a toolbox. You have a hammer, you have a bunch of screwdrivers, you have some pliers, that's a toolbox. If you don't have hammer and pliers, you don't have a toolbox. You, you, you might have a box, but no tools. 
A, a will is the hammer. Okay. You, you know what it does. You know what it's for. It, it makes the decision easy. A trust is like a screwdriver. It might be a Phillips head. It might be slotted. It might be one of those two inch long nubby deals that are designed for tight places. It might be a very, very small screwdriver that's designed to fix your eyeglasses. And, and so that's a good example of, of the different, the fact that there are different trusts. Um, I, I can draft you a trust that is irrevocable and you might need that for taxation or Medicaid planning purposes. I can draft you a trust that is revocable, which gives you the most amount of control of the assets in the trust during your lifetime. <clears throat> but those are two different things and they accomplish two different goals. So uh, there is no one size fits all aspect to trust, just like there is no one size fits all answer to screwdrivers. Make sense? Makes sense. <laughs> all right. So a things that are held in trust don't go through probate. And for a long time, uh, attorneys wanted you to use a trust to avoid probate because probate was actually quite difficult. I'm licensed in Colorado and in Michigan, and, and neither state is probate difficult. Probate is easy in both Michigan and Colorado. But trusts could still be useful. Trusts um, are usually longer documents, and you can use more ink, and you can stretch out your thinking, and you can provide for more people, and you can um, divvy up assets in... in um, in uneven and unequal ways. Um, and that might be your plan. And a trust is a little bit better vehicle to do that. I very often use trusts for people who are blending families. You know, he's bringing his kids, she's bringing her kids, and they wanna divide out their assets differently or protect assets that they brought to the marriage um, in, in much like a, a prenuptial agreement might work. Um, trusts are wonderful for that. Trusts are also fantastic and frankly, sometimes absolutely necessary when I'm dealing with a family that has a uh, special needs adult um, where we could draft a certain kind of trust that would allow us to warehouse some cash, um, but still qualify the adult for um, SSDI or Medicaid or whatever the need may be. Um, we use certain terms of art in the trust, like I said, to protect assets uh, from being counted uh, and trusts are, are, you can't do without it in a situation like that. So uh, and trusts are also incredibly useful in Colorado where uh, home prices are, are high. Um, you know, any number of clients come in and they have uh, modest assets and the checking account and a car and, you know, pots and pans, but the house is worth a million dollars all of a sudden. And, um, you know, how do we deal with this? So you, trusts become useful creatures under the right set of circumstances. And I wanna be very precise with my clients about when and whether to use a trust. I know you need a will. Can't promise you you need a trust. And if I'm gonna draft one for you, I wanna make doggone sure that you're gonna get mileage out of it. Makes sense. And, and that kind of leads into uh, another question, which is who who really should be doing estate planning? You know, sounds like pretty much everybody should do a will, but not everybody should do a trust. Is that accurate? Yeah, it is. And um, I, I give my clients a questionnaire that I ask them to fill out. I don't need your whole bank account, but I'd like to make sure that you have a good handle on your belongings and what you own. And, and, and that will clue me into whether you can get mileage out of a trust. For example, if I'm talking to somebody in their early 30s and they've got a great start on retirement and um, they're going to inherit you know, from mom and dad or something like that, I might want to talk to them about a trust. Whereas another client um, in their 30s starting out in life, um, trust might be premature to think about. No, they just don't need it. Um, everybody does need a will from my perspective. And I don't want to oversell this, but it's not an expensive document and it sure buys a lot of peace of mind. What I will tell you is that I draft different wills at different phases of life. For example, um, I know you have young children, Matt, you might want to have a will that specifically names a guardian in case both you and your wife die in a car accident. If you, if you guys die in a common disaster, mm -hmm. then you're going to want to pave the road for your brother or her sister or your mom and dad or whoever it would be to be that guardian for your kids. You'd make it a lot easier for them to go to court and be named guardian for your minor children. And they can't do without one. So if we don't have that laid out and spelled out, um, that becomes a bit of a floor fight in court, um, which gets expensive and creates hard feelings. And frankly, it's the children who suffer because in addition to dealing with the loss of their parents, they're dealing with the struggle of, of why is everybody fighting? Uh, 
Um, so a guardian is, is becomes the most important part of a will for people in their 20s and 30s who have a minor child. Completely useless for somebody who's in their 70s. They don't have minor children by now. And, and the goals of a will for somebody at that stage of life are very different. I, I generally tend to counsel people that they might, might draft two or three wills over a 30 or 40 year span. Some people need to draft them more frequently. Um, people in transition, you know, if they're getting married or getting divorced or somebody passed away or, or there's a sudden asset change, uh, you win the lottery or, you know, you just inherited two houses because, you know, your aunt died. Those sorts of things um, are good times in life to look at your estate planning documents and make sure that your will's in shape to deal with the current reality. That makes sense. So to, to narrow that down even further, just say, hey, if, if you don't have a will, you should talk to John. And if you yep. have a will, if a big life change happens, you should talk to John. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I, I, once in a while, and, and um, you know what happens frequently, somebody brings me a will that is four or five years old and they, you know, are thinking about a new one. And frankly, the document's good enough. I'll tell them that. Um, but very often people simply want to fresh it up because it's stale, you know, it's 10 years old or so. If you're, it, for those of you listening to this in 2021, if your will is older than 15 years, have it looked at, you know, let, let's put it that way. It's probably a little stale and we probably would, would be wise to review it. If it's older than that, you, yeah, you know, if it's older than 20 years, let's definitely step it up and bring it up to the modern code. Um, if it's newer than five years, it's probably fine. You know, there's a real good chance that it's a good will. Um, you know what, let me, let me go ahead and insult some competition for a quick minute, just for good television's sake. Um, if you went to, you know, onlineformlawyer.com, you did not get a good will, period. Your, your will will create as many problems as it solves going through the probate process. Time and time again, I see a will that somebody got off of line and the wording is incorrect and the flow is incorrect. It's not what they wanted, but it is what they're stuck with. You can get food out of a gas station vending machine. You can, but it's not dinner. You're not going to get vegetables. Let's, let's, you know, think about it. Okay. I'm not much more expensive than, you know, free, you know, today gone tomorrow, lawyer.com, um, you know, spend a little bit more money, talk to a professional, um, me or somebody like me, get the advice you need. Um, that's they, I can't stress that enough. I've, I've yet to see an online form that works for somebody. These forms are drafted in other states, by the way. That's half the reason why they don't work in Colorado. Colorado lawyer didn't, didn't draft them for Colorado. Somebody else in another state drafted them using that state's law. And sometimes, well, as often as not, that's the problem. So, you know, pay attention to that, folks. Um, yeah, that's, you know, can't stress that one enough. <laughs> I think that's a, that's a good place to end. And it's a good call to action of, Hey, if you're there, it, it's, it's a good thing to kind of reach out and, and learn more and, and make sure that you're having an actual lawyer in your actual state. Look at what you're doing. Do we have time to add um, one more comment about the uh, rest of the estate plan? Wills and trusts are the backbone. The will is the backbone of the estate plan and a trust is sometimes indicated, but there are two other documents I want to bring to people's attention. Powers of attorney, you need a medical power of attorney and you need a financial power of attorney. And frankly, most people need those more than they even need a will. Those documents direct traffic while you're still alive, but you're unable to make decisions. doesn't matter whether you're backpacking through Australia for a month or if you're in an iron lung machine. If you are unable to make your own decisions, you need to name somebody to do it for you. They need to go to the bank. They need to pay bills. They might need to sell property. They might need to create a trust for you. They might need to do any number of things to put you in a good position. With a doctor, they might need to tell the doctor, yes, it's time to pull the plug. You need these directives in place. And these powers of attorney are part of a good estate plan, a thorough estate plan. And so I would encourage you when you're thinking about a will to also think about your powers of attorney and make sure those documents are up to snuff as well. That's that's really good advice as well. And John, I, I really do appreciate you coming on today and uh, you know interview not you know, being here for this interview, but educating uh, viewers of this to you know know what they should be doing with their estate planning. So thank you very much. I, I highly recommend John. He's a great guy. He's a great lawyer. If you're watching this and and uh, you, you need some work, highly recommend him. So thank you, John, for being here and, and thank you everybody for joining today. Thanks, Matt. It's good to see you. Thank you.